My name is Larry Stone, and I've been a volunteer with Honor Flight since 2009. I'll be providing information you will need to carry out your responsibilities as a guardian. First of all, we thank you for volunteering to be a guardian. It is a crucial position that is most appreciated by the veterans. I put my phone number on this slide in case you have any questions. You can call me at 614-436-8584 or contact the Honor Flight Columbus office if you need additional information on the topics covered in this video. A printout of the slides used in this presentation begins on page one of the printed materials. These are the topics we'll be covering. Introductory information, what to expect on Saturday on a typical trip, veteran safety and comfort issues, medical issues, guardian responsibilities, and what happens next. We will not be covering specific details for each of the memorials, as much of that is in the printed materials. The World War II Memorial was dedicated in May of 2004, and in May of 2005, the first honor flight left from Springfield, Ohio, in private planes. Due to continuing and growing interest in the desire to take more veterans, the following year they changed over to taking groups on commercial flights. Presently, there are 137 cities in 43 states. The Columbus Hub was established in 2007. We have flown over 3,600 veterans to Washington, D.C. See page 8 of the resource materials for a Columbus fact sheet or visit our website for more information. We take approximately 80 veterans on each trip. They'll be wearing white shirts and about 50 guardians in blue shirts. Ground crew members wear yellow shirts and provide tremendous support at the Columbus and Baltimore airports. Each trip costs about $50,000, including plane rental, bus rental, food, etc. Our itinerary in Washington is not fixed. We may vary the order of our stops due to a number of factors. We use three buses throughout the day. You are or will be assigned to the red, green, or blue bus and one of nine teams. There are three teams to a bus, each having a team captain and an assistant team captain. These are the folks you can go to if you have questions or need help with anything. Each bus also has a bus leader. The importance of your role as a guardian cannot be overstated. It is crucial for the safety and support of the veterans. We simply cannot do it without your help. Our chief concern is for the safety of all veterans. You'll hear a lot more about that later. There are a number of things we'd like you to do as far as your relationship with the veterans is concerned. One thing we discovered is that some veterans who are not in combat may feel that they are not worthy of recognition as the combat are, veterans are. Of course, that is not the case. As we all know that if the truck driver didn't do his job, the troops would not have supplies they need. Likewise, if the instructor who never left the states did not train combat forces, where would we be? The bottom line is that we need to show these folks that they are, were important and valued members of a huge team that got the job done. All veterans on the trip deserve to be treated as royalty, and you need to do whatever is necessary to make that happen, not just for your veteran, but for all of them. This trip is a big deal for them, and numerous veterans have expressed that this was a very important day for them. You also need to be aware that there were medically trained guardians on the trip. More about medical issues later. Now please turn to page 7 of your, of your resource materials. This is called a team list and it contains a wealth of information on veterans and guardians on a bus. You will receive one of these for your bus and will receive, by email, updated versions prior to your trip date as changes occur. I'll be going through this fairly rapidly, so you may want to review the printed material later. Note that the word blue is in the first column and that there are 28 entries. This list is for the 28 veterans on the blue bus. There is a team list for each bus. Note also that some guardians have two veterans assigned to them. In the upper left-hand corner, we find the date 
and time this list was printed. Veterans cancel up until the Friday before the trip, so it is important to use the latest version of this list. The entries for each line are sorted by team number and then by guardian last name. In the notes column, C and A indicate the team captain and assistant team captain respectively. A D means that the guardian has two or more veterans assigned. The medical column shows you who on your bus is medically trained, with P being for a physician, N for a nurse, E for emergency medical technician, and O for other medical. We'll talk about the DC guardians and tasks later. For now, all you need to remember is that they are listed on the team list. Obviously, the veteran column lists each veteran assigned to the bus, with details about each veteran in the next columns. The service column indicates when the veteran served, with a W being World War II, a K being Korea, and B being service in both wars. Additional des designations are listed in your materials. The W chair, diabetes, and blind columns show each veteran's status for those items. The lift column shows which veterans cannot handle the stairs on the bus and need to use a wheelchair lift to get them on and off the bus. We seldom have more than one or two of these per bus. Often there are not any at all. The oxygen column shows whether or not the veteran needs oxygen during the day or at night, with a Z indicating nighttime only. Travel with shows the names of veterans traveling together. The chart at the bottom left is mainly for the use of bus leaders, team captains, and assistant captains, and provides summary information for those on each bus. Let's look at what you can expect to experience on Saturday. Arrival time at Port Columbus is 4.45 a.m. I know that is early, but that is when you will need to be there. Members of the ground crew arrive at 4.15. Veterans arrive by 5.30. Essentially, you have two parking options. The blue lot is $8 a day, and the long-term garage is $17 a day. Many guardians prefer to park in the garage at $17 a day, as it's really worth it at the end of a tiring day to not have to make your way to a remote lot. If you're bringing a veteran, you still need to arrive by 4.45. Before parking, you can drop the veteran off at the South Departures door, where a ground crew member will escort the veteran to the check-in area near the Southwest Airlines baggage claim area. Wheelchairs will be available at the door. When you arrive at Southwest Baggage Claim, stop at the Guardian check-in table to pick up your name badge, and then proceed to the assembly area where red, green, and blue banners indicate where to go depending on your bus color. If your name badge has a WC in the upper right corner, you have been assigned a wheelchair for the day. Ground crew members provide assistance in many ways, including getting veterans into wheelchairs and helping them get into their shirts. You'll probably have to look around for your veteran, and if he or she has arrived, but not in a wheelchair and one is assigned, you should secure one from the wheelchair parking area. After greeting your veteran, provide assistance as appropriate, including offering to carry per carrying personal items, such as a jacket. This is where a backpack comes in handy. We urge you to take photos for sharing with your veteran throughout the day, starting at the assembly area. Be sure to have someone take a picture of you with your veteran. If you or your veteran have any restricted items, you can give them to a ground crew member who will keep them for you and return them to you when you get back in the evening. He will also be issued boarding passes for you and your veteran and a commemorative metro medal for your veteran. At five o'clock, there'll be a mandatory meeting of all guardians on the trip to discuss last minute items and be introduced to the medically trained guardians. You will be told when to head for the security area. Wheelchairs are not permitted on escalators 
and you will be directed to the elevators. It depends on the level of security as to how much we have to do to get through security. We may have to do very little, and we may have to do a lot. Usually we don't have to take off our shoes. We definitely will need to show boarding passes and driver's licenses, and have found it helpful to place both of them in your name badge holder for easy access. When you get to the gate, ground crew members will provide coffee, orange juice, and snacks. If your veteran is in a wheelchair but is able to walk from the gate area to the plane and down the aisle, place the wheelchair near the boarding door so Southwest crew members can load them on the plane. We urge you to suggest that your veteran use the restroom before departure as the flight to Baltimore takes an hour and then it takes some time to unload the plane. Boarding on the plane only occurs when we are told and there are no assigned seats. However, we load from the rear of the plane to the front, as we found this is the most efficient and fastest way to do so. Please go as far back as possible and sit where Dave Schott, who will be in the, in the aisle, assigns you. Those veterans who need to stay in their wheelchairs board last and sit in the front of the cabin. You may not be able to sit with your veteran. One reason is that we have guardians only sit in the exit rows thus precluding these guardians from sitting with their vet veterans. If a veteran needs to use the restroom during the flight, a guardian needs to be in front of the veteran and another behind him or her in order to provide assistance should turbulence be encountered. So if you see a veteran stand up and you are in an aisle seat, please get up and escort as appropriate. When we arrive at Baltimore Washington International Airport, usually referred to as BWI, stay seated until you are told to exit. We unload from the back of the plane to the front, and Dave Schott will again orchestrate leaving the plane. The wheelchairs will be unloaded as quickly as possible and placed in the jetway close to the plane's door. If your veteran needs a chair immediately, wait for one to arrive. If he or she can walk a bit, go with them, but be sure to come back and get a chair. Remember, you can take any chair, as a specific chair is not assigned to you. Upon exiting the jetway, there will be a line of military personnel and members of the public to greet the veterans. Try not to rush through the line and give your veteran a chance to shake hands. Baltimore ground crew members will direct you to the restrooms. You may want to again advise your veteran that it may take as long as an hour before we hit another restroom. There is a restroom on the bus, however. Your next task is to get for the veteran on the correct bus as soon as possible. The BWI ground crew will direct you to the buses. Do not use the moving sidewalks. If you have a DC guardian assigned to you, this is where he or she will join you. More on DC guardians later. The first guardians who get to the buses need to man the top and bottom of the stairs until the assigned guardian arrives. More on top and bottom of the stairs later. Again, there is a restroom on the bus. Due to the motion of the bus, it is imperative that any veteran leaving his or her seat be escorted by two guardians. The World War II Memorial may or may not be the first stop upon arriving in Washington. The procedure for exiting the bus will be the same at each stop. Wheelchair wranglers get off first to unload the wheelchairs then the rest of the guardians, followed by the veterans. You can leave anything you wish on the bus, uh, which will depart the drop-off area and return later. We suggest that you take lots of photos to share with your veteran. One at the Ohio Pillar, perhaps one at the State Pillar where your veteran may have lived, in front of the Field of Stars, in front of the names of places where your veteran may have served. Kilroy. This image, and Kilroy was here, was scratched on walls throughout the world by GIs. The graffiti became a national joke, and veterans get a real kick out of seeing it on a memorial. It is located on the Pacific side, on the back side of the Pennsylvania pillar. Don't miss the 24 bas relief sculptures depicting events and activities associated with World War II. Your veteran may appreciate a photo in front of a plaque 
and has special meaning to him or her. If you have a DC guardian assigned to you, that person should stay with you to assist you as necessary. He or she should not go off with your second veteran. We usually spend an hour to an hour and a half at the World War II Memorial. You should not leave the World War II Memorial grounds. Senators Bob and Elizabeth Dole may arrive to welcome the veterans. If they do, they will be located near the bus drop-off point. Veterans are welcome to have their picture taken with the Doles, but do not shake Senator Bob's hand as he is getting quite frail. Before leaving the bus, you will be told when to get back at the drop-off point. Please be prompt so we won't have to send out a search party. Box lunches will be provided on the buses around noon, no matter where we are. Your assistance in distributing water at this time will be appreciated. At the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery, we ask that you be quiet and shut off your cell phones before the ceremony begins. If you make noise, you will get talked to by security personnel. If you have a wheelchair, you will be directed to a special area to view the ceremony. Keep off the steps on your left as you approach the area. They are slippery, especially when wet, and we have seen far too many falls there. No problem taking photos or videos, just be quiet in doing so. Audie Murphy's grave, the Challenger, and the USS Maine memorials are across the street from the amphitheater. Another stop we make is at the Korean War Memorial, the Vietnam War Memorial, and the Lincoln Memorial. All three of these are within walking distance of each other, and you are permitted to cross the streets there. You can read more about these memorials in your materials. If your veteran is interested, there's a little souvenir stand in front of the Lincoln Memorial that sells all types of medals from military units. There's also a snack bar near where the buses park to unload. Because of the distances involved, veterans who may want to use a wheelchair should probably consider using one here. You'll need at least 45 minutes to visit all three memorials. The striking Air Force Memorial, located on the Virginia side also, affords a beautiful view of the city of Washington. We often take photos of veterans and guardians grouped by bus at the Air Force Memorial, so don't miss that. The Marine Corps Memorial, also known as the Iwo Jima Memorial, is also on the Virginia side, just north of Arlington Cemetery. The bus photos may also be taken there. When taking pictures of the statue, be very careful backing up, as you could easily fall off the steps. By mid-afternoon, some veterans may need be, indeed be getting tired and may not want to leave the bus. That is perfectly okay, as the buses do not usually leave us at this time. The Naval Memorial is in downtown Washington. It is noted for its fountains, bar relief sculptures, and the Lone Sailor statue. The Women and Military Service Memorial is near the entrance to Arlington National Cemetery. As you will see on the trip, we end up doing quite a bit of cruising around Washington and end up driving past a number of interesting places that will be pointed out by the bus leaders. The bus leaders will also let you know when we will be heading back to Baltimore, which is usually an hour's ride. Each veteran will receive a large envelope containing numerous letters and thank you notes during mail call on the bus ride to be back to BWI. If boarding passes are not distributed on the bus, they will be upon arrival at the airport. When we arrive at BWI, we'll exit the bus in the usual order and proceed inside. After going through securities, we'll head for the gate, again keeping off the moving sidewalks. Sandwiches and pop will be waiting for us at the gate. Please serve your veteran first, and then get your own food. The boarding procedure will be the same as it was in the morning. Dave Schott will be in charge of seating. We are usually scheduled to leave the gate about 8 p.m., with the flight being a little over an hour. As we taxi to the gate in Columbus, watch for a water cannon salute from the Columbus Fire Department. Unloading the plane will be from back to front, the same as it was in Baltimore. 
Each veteran and guardian will receive a folder from ground crew members at the gate area. Veterans in wheelchairs should be transferred to airport wheelchairs at this time, with honor flight wheelchairs turned over to ground crew members. Don't leave or let your veteran leave the gate area as we depart the gate as a group. If you are carrying an assigned bag, such as a snack bag, turn it over to the appropriate ground crew member at this time. As was the case in Baltimore, there will be a large crowd in the terminal to greet the veterans. Try to go fairly slowly through the welcome line. After a short ceremony that ends with the singing of God Bless America, make sure your veteran hooks up with his or her family. If the veteran drove himself or herself, make sure to escort them to their car for safety's sake. Turning now to veteran safety and comfort, the safety of our veterans is our number one concern, and we all need to be pro proactive in this regard. So if you see anything that might impact the safety of a veteran, take action to rectify the situation or report it to someone who can deal with it. If you see an unescorted veteran moving down the aisle on a moving bus, get up and follow him or her to the restroom. If you see a veteran, even if he or she is not your veteran, who needs help in any way, take appropriate action. Be sure to bring your cell phone for the trip so you can call medically trained guardians using the cell phone numbers on the back of your badge. We've talked about removing sidewalks already, but what if a veteran gets on one anyway? You need to get on the sidewalk with him or her, stand next to them, and be ready to assist them in exiting the sidewalk. A backpack is really handy for you to carry your veteran's jacket and so forth. It's been suggested that you might want to include a small blanket, band-aids, and extra camera batteries in your backpack. Getting on and off the bus is a critical time for potential falls, and the role of guardians assigned to the top and bottom steps is an important one for veteran safety. Since you might need to assume one of these positions, we ask that you pay close attention to the following video. At Honor Flight Columbus, the safety of our veterans is of utmost importance. There are two critical points for potential safety issues during a trip. When the veterans get on and off the buses, and when utilizing the bus lift for veterans who cannot use the stairs. We'll deal with the steps first, as they pose a very real risk for a fall resulting in serious injury to a veteran that could be devastating to the veteran and might cast a pall over the rest of the trip. Experienced guardians are assigned to the top and bottom of the steps of each bus to assist veterans and are usually present during boarding and offloading. However, there are occasions during each trip when one or more of the assigned guardians may not be present when boarding begins or when offloading occurs. If you see that is the case, you should assume one of the positions. No veteran should get on or off the bus without guardians at the top and bottom of the steps. Therefore, we ask that you pay close attention to this video, as it will demonstrate what guardians should do when assuming one of these very responsible positions. Three important concepts are to keep in mind. One, only one veteran at a time is allowed to go up or down the steps. Two, the guardian at the top needs to make sure that those at the bottom are ready before releasing a veteran to go down. The same is true for bottom guardians when loading. 3. Guardians need to be ready to catch a veteran if he or she falters or begins to fall. Let's look at the video in detail. Some veterans are quite spry and seem to want to take the stairs rapidly to prove it. Note that the guardians are alert and ready for anything that might happen. Others need considerably more attention.
up. Big step there, mate. Let's look at those again. Here's a gentleman that uh, is pretty spry. He starts to get on, but whoa, he falters a little bit. But the guardians are there to help him up. And again, the upper guardian helps him get further into the bus. The lower guardian was behind him should he fall. The same is true for this lady. The lower guardian follows her all the way up until the upper guardian can take care of her from there on. This gentleman getting on now is a, uh, is a guardian, so he doesn't need assistance. Here's another man that's well, walking well, starts to get up. Little hesitation there, but the guardians at the bottom were ready to catch him. And the man at the top also follows them through. Here we have a gentleman who is in the wheelchair getting off the bus. Uh, we pass the cane down to the lower guardian and then the, the uh, veteran holds on to the grips on the side of the bus. Most of them don't want to hold your hand because it's not that steady. They'll take the care of the grip and then he's helped off. Here he is getting back on the bus. He's helped over to the bus by the Guardian's at the bottom. He again takes hold of the grips and pulls himself up with the guardian, the lower guardian being right behind him, keeping his hand on him. Lots of times they like that for assurance that there's somebody there. And then he gets up to the upper guardian and the lower guardian is staying right with him and makes sure he's steady on his feet in the aisle and then he'll pass them as cane. Usually there are only three or four veterans per bus who use the lift. If your veteran is using the lift when unloading, you should wait for him or her outside the bus near the lift and assist in removing the wheelchair from the lift. An experienced guardian is usually assigned to lift duties inside the bus. As is the case with the steps, you may be called upon to fill in for this person, so pay close attention to this portion of the video. Operation of the lift is the responsibility of the bus driver. During the loading process, we utilize the following procedure. The wheelchair is pushed onto the lift very carefully, and both wheels are locked down. A safety strap is placed behind the chair. After checking, Make sure everybody's ready up on the bus. Bus driver activates the lift. When the lift is level with the floor, the inside guardian unlocks the wheelchair and pulls it inside the bus. Caution, do not step on the platform until it stops when level with the floor as to do so may damage the mechanism and cause delays. Here he is unlocking the wheelchair and pulling it inside. After he gets it inside, he'll lock it down and assist the veteran in getting to his or her seat. Here's another one. Again, it's locked down. A safety strap is applied. Bus driver has checked inside and has activated the lift. And the inside guardian who's filling in, by the way, for a regular person. Wheels unlocks the 
wheelchair and wheels him inside and assists him inside. And we'll look at what happens on the inside with the same veteran. The guardian helps him up, watches him carefully so that he does not fall, and guides him to his seat, always ready to catch him should he fall. and he's safely placed in his seat. Again, if you feel it is appropriate, let your veteran know that there are extra wheelchairs available if needed. This is especially important later in the day when veterans become tired. Along the same lines, it is perfectly okay for your veteran to stay on the bus for a particular stop. You need not stay on the bus with your veteran. Having said that, you absolutely need to stay with your veteran at all other times. Sometimes veteran and or guardian family members meet them at one of the memorials. That is fine. However, you need to keep in mind that the veteran is your responsibility and must stay with you. Family members are welcome to join you, but you are in charge. Do not let the veteran go off with family members or with a DC guardian. Do not leave the memorial being visited. Do not cross streets. When passing out bottles of water, be sure to loosen the cap, as many veterans have arthritic hands. If you are lucky enough to sit next to your veteran, or any veteran, on the airplanes, see if they are comfortable and help them adjust the airflow if they are too warm or too cool. A reminder to check often with your veteran on the need for a restroom stop, and make sure you escort veterans to the restroom on a plane or bus. If you find something that's not to your pleasure, don't complain to your veteran or to a fellow guardian, as negativity could ruin the trip for your veteran. Instead, try to be positive throughout the day. If you encounter a problem, talk to your bus leader about it, and he or she will follow through on it. The next topic concerns wheelchairs. Bobby Richards, former co-director of Honor Flight Columbus, will now share with you everything you wanted to know about wheelchairs. Okay, if you have paper and pencil in front of you, I'd like you to write down the acronym SCAR, S-C-A-R. The acronym SCAR, S-C-A-R. Now we don't want anybody to come home with any of those. <laughs> of any kind. But I want to use that acronym to clue you into some things about wheelchairs that are very, very important. The S stands for safety. That's the number one thing that we're concerned about on this trip. Yes, we want them to have a wonderful, meaningful experience on Saturday. But part of the way that happens is by assuring that we've done everything we possibly can to keep them safe. Now when it comes to wheelchairs, there are a number of things that we want you to pay attention to in terms of safety. Linda, could I ask you to come up and be my, sure. my model? Alright, so Linda's my vet and um, she's, she needs the wheelchair for the day. All right. You'll notice that, if you can see here, that the, the, um, kick, the foot pedals are down on this. So the first thing I'm going to do, after I lock the chair, she can help me, that's fine. And your vet may want to help, that's fine. I'm going to make sure that those foot pedals are greased. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that was bad. Um, I'm going to make sure those are out of the way because it's very easy to trip over those. Linda, I'm going to have you have a seat here. Now remember I said it's locked. A lot of your vets will be able to get up and down on their own, and that's fine. If not, you're just going to kind of guide them gently. You're going to... <laughs> I'm only going to do it one more time, I promise. 
uh, put those foot pedals down. Now, when I'm standing behind a standing Linda, we don't take up lots and lots of space. But the space in front of Linda now is much expanded. How many of you are used to pushing a wheelchair on a daily basis? A couple hands, most of you not. How many of you think you might end up pushing a wheelchair on your trip on Saturday? Everybody put your hand up because you will be surprised. A lot of those people that don't have a WC after their name <coughs> might want one as the day goes on. So when I'm pushing Linda, I have to be exceedingly careful to make allowance for that space in front of her. Because if I'm not paying attention and I'm walking along like this, we get there a whole lot faster than Linda's shoulders do. Okay? And we're going to run into someone. And it hurts. <laughs> and you don't want to do that to the veteran that's standing there. A particular place to watch for this is when you're waiting to board the plane, or you're coming off of the airplane, um, pushing the um, wheelchairs through the memorials where there are lots of people around. It's very easy to get distracted as you are pushing. So please pay careful attention to that. So that is a major safety factor. Another safety factor, and this is absolutely critical, is that your vet does not stand up or sit down unless the wheelchair is locked. Okay? Now, a lot of times, because your veteran is not used to being in a wheelchair, we're going to pull up and your vet's going to start to jump out. A simple hand on the shoulder, a little rub, say, just a minute. Let me, let me lock that for you. Or, do you want to get this side? Okay? And work together if you involve your vet in that process. Because if your vet is not used to being in a wheelchair, that's going to be a, an issue more than likely. If your vet is used to using a wheelchair, he or she may not lock the wheelchair at home. <laughs> and that's, that's fine for home, but we're charged with keeping our vets safe. So, fast rule, wheelchair must be locked both sides before the vet stands up or sits down. The other thing is, give me just a minute, Linda, put these footrests up. And you give a hand with the footrest. Last time, I promise. And you may need to lift your, your vet's leg a little bit to help do that, OK? And then when your vet goes to stand up, just be ready in case your vet needs a little assist, a little gentle assist. Thank you very much. I'm finished with you. <laughs> if you park your wheelchair for, you know, you stop for a second, and you're pushing along and your, your vet's walking along with you, you stop, don't take your hands off of it unless it's locked for two reasons. One, it may roll. Okay. The second is your vet or another vet may decide to take sit down. Okay. So please. Always make sure that your wheelchair is locked. Any questions about safety? All right, C. What do you think C stands for? I'm trying to keep you engaged. I know you're tired. C stands for comfort. Now, first of all, if, if your vet uses a wheelchair regularly, they're in one of our wheelchairs, which does not fit them the same way that their own personal wheelchair does. Secondly, if they're not used to riding in a wheelchair, it's going to feel very strange to them. So you want to do all that you can to make them comfortable. I'm not going to demonstrate, but you could adjust the footrests, <laughs> okay, to get them at a more comfortable angle for them. All right? The second thing is, um, I can't show you because this is the wheelchair from the church, but as you saw in that picture, all of our wheelchairs are marked with a big red X on the back, with the exceptions of the ones that have an orange. And that orange X indicates that it is a larger, what we call the Cadillac size wheelchair. If your vet needs that larger size, that needs to be identified in the morning. We can tag that wheelchair with your vet's name. If your vet does not need an orange wheelchair, do not take the orange marked wheelchair. We got to the World War II Memorial one day, one day. Everybody was off the bus except one lady who needed to come down on the lift. She needed a Cadillac and all that was left was the teeny tiny one. 
she was not going to get to see her memorial. So we've got a process in place where we can mark that um, chair so that you know it's for your vet. Please, please don't grab that larger size chair if your vet doesn't need it. I mean, if you get down and you're the last one getting a chair and there's an orange chair there, no problem. But, but don't take it away from somebody who needs it. Those are the comfort issues um, that we want to talk about. The A stands for, for lack of a better word, accessibility. I can be pushing my vet along, and I'm having a wonderful time looking at all these things over here. This is a really, isn't this nice? What do you suppose that, that statue means? My vet's looking that way. You want to make sure that your vet is front and center to whatever it is that you're, you're showing him or her, okay? So turn your wheelchair, let them get close. When you're at the World War II Memorial, there are a series of, of bronze plaques in the walls, one for the Atlantic, one for the Pacific, and you can walk your vet along there. Some of them are low enough that they can physically touch them. But they've got to be able to see them so that they can tell you the stories. That's a great story opportunity, so use that. But make sure your vet can see what you're, what you're all about, all right? A lot of you will find that your vets are hard of hearing. Are they more able to hear out of one ear than they can the other? Make sure you know that, so that if, if they can hear out of their right ear, that when you're talking to them, you get down by their right ear so they can hear what's going on. You're a long ways from them. It's not like somebody's standing right beside you, and you don't have the visual of, of facing them so that they're picking up cues from your face. So make sure that you are down here where they can hear you. When you're at the airport, whether you're assigned to a wheelchair or not, and you're talking to somebody in a wheelchair, Give them a break. Don't stay up here. Your knees will recover on Sunday, maybe Monday, but your knees will recover. So get down to their level so that you're facing them and having conversation with them. The other thing is, how many of you, show of hands, how many of you, when you get on an elevator, you look at the back of the elevator? You stand with your back to the, you know, with your back to the door. Pay attention when you put the wheelchair in, okay? They, they want to be part of what's going on as well. Any questions about accessibility? Okay, what letter's left? R. R. That stands for responsibility, and that's yours. If there are six hubs in town on that day, and a bunch of them are at the World War II Memorial at the same time, and you park your wheelchair, guess what? It will be gone because maybe they didn't bring enough wheelchairs, or that needs to sit down, okay? You are assigned to that wheelchair. It needs to be with you at all times. Don't park it. Don't park it and expect it to be there. The second thing is if you happen to see a wheelchair that is marked with a big red X and there's nobody around that looks like one of Columbus's people, grab it so that we have it so that we can use it for other veterans. Now, your veteran may say to you, I don't need a wheelchair. I can guarantee you somebody will say it to you. That's okay, the wheelchair is assigned to you. It's there for your veteran to use as he or she may need. A lot of these vets go on this trip and think they don't, they, they walk all the time at home, but they don't know what the day is like and they don't know that they might need this chair. So it is assigned to you for the day. There are times when it's okay to leave it on the, on the bus when you are at, um, for example, the Marine Corps Memorial the Iwo Jima statue. That's an okay place if your vet says, oh, I don't need that. That's okay. But other than that, pretty much, you're going to have it off, off the bus and, and therefore your vet to use as needed, okay? Responsibility includes getting that air of wheelchair when you get off the plane. They come off differently. You may already be off with your vet. You may have to go back and get your wheelchair. It's assigned to you. It is your responsibility, okay? So. Any questions about wheelchairs? Yes, ma'am. 
So when you said even if your vet's a walker, mm -hmm. um, they might want the wheelchair, does that mean that we take a wheelchair for every vet even if they said they can walk? No, ma'am. Okay. The vets are screened when the calls are made to get them signed up for the trip. And sometimes they say, yes, I need a, a wheel, wheelchair for the day. Sometimes we say, we're taking a wheelchair for you, okay? Um, sometimes you may get, um, when you call your vet the week before the trip and get acquainted with them, your vet may give you some clues that mm, there's not a WC after their name, maybe there should be, at which point you're going to let Kay know right away so that she can get one. Or you may get to the airport on Saturday morning and maybe they fell the day before or maybe they're just not as steady on their feet as they think and your alarm goes off that mm, we need to have a wheelchair. Okay, great question. Anything else? What do we do with wheelchairs when we come back? Gosh, they need to get off the plane so that they can get handed over to the folks in the bright yellow shirt like you saw Jim Bivin wearing. Um, there are marvelous people out there who make this happen behind the scenes to make it easier for all of us and, and the, the ground crew out there will take your wheelchairs from you and get them back to the right place. You'll be handing off your bed. None of these wheelchairs go out to the garage at the end of the day. They stay inside. So if your vet needs a ride out to the car with the family, then they need to go in the chair from the airport. Great question. Anything else? Great. We're going to have a terrific trip. We'll deal with medical issues next. Dr. Tom Engelhart will start us off, after which we will touch base on several additional medical items. Just like Bobby, I'm going to have you write down three letters. This is my acronym. S-V-C. Split it. <laughs> it <doesn't mean. laughs> Go for it. It doesn't mean anything. But as far as medical, okay, first, the first one, safety. Okay, is, is uh, Hippocratic Oath, you know, we take a Hippocratic Oath as physicians, say first do no harm, okay? Safety first. Pay attention to everything that Bobby says, to heed everything. Uh, don't run wheelchairs into people. We're not going to induce any injuries on these individuals, okay? So safety. Second one is vigilance. Uh, as, as this population is an aging population. Uh, we got individuals in their, in their 80s. Uh, I don't know if we have any in their 90s on this flight. 97. Place. 97. Yeah. My goodness. So as their body ages, everything changes. Uh, you know, you're going to have individuals who lack hearing. Their vision is not the same. Uh, their mind is not the same. There's dementia. There's Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Uh, their kidneys and bladders don't uh, work the same. You know, their bowels don't work the same. Um, their bones are brittle. Their lungs are not as strong. Their heart has, has beat multiple, multiple times. And we only have so many beats left in our heart, you know. So uh, these individuals are, are delicate. And so my, my second uh, letter, vigilance, be attentive. When you establish rapport, many of you have taken family members, so you know what their persona is like. You know how they interact. Uh, those that you have not met yet, Get a baseline reading of how these individuals are, you know, how they interact, what their men mental status is, and, and, and just kind of key in on that. And if you see any change in their mental status throughout the day, it could be meant one of many things. And, and the C stands for communicate. Find a person with a red shirt. You know, we're going to be there, we're going to be standing out uh, uh, in these bright red shirts. If you, if you see anything that is concerning, that has changed in your individual, Contact uh, somebody in the red shirt and say, hey, here's my bed. I, I want you to take a look at them. We can assess them. Um, how many first-timers do we have on this flight? Excellent. How many medical people do we have on this flight? Okay, so uh, key in on the medical people and everything. And if, you have, if, if, you're, if you're not a red shirt individual and you are medical, you, you know what to do, okay? Anything that changes in their mental status, let us know um, because we'll, we will assess them. Um, the main thing is confusion. Confusion can be, be one of many things. It could be that you know, uh, their dementia has progressed. It could be that they're, they're suffering a, a mild stroke. It could be that they're dehydrated. Uh, it could be one of many things. So just be attentive. So um, just remember safety, vigilance, and communication. And uh, we'll bring all these vets home. So that's, that's basically things in a nutshell. So uh, any questions? Fortunately, we haven't had many medical issues. But should one occur, we have at least 10 medically trained guardians on every trip. Those assigned to your bus are indicated on the team list we discussed earlier. 
Basically, if you have any medical questions or issues, you should contact a medically trained guardian as soon as possible. The fastest way to do this is to call one of those listed on the back of your name badge and request that he or she come to your location. If you have a veteran who uses a wheelchair who is having difficulty managing the steps of the bus, consider asking him or her if they would like to use the wheelchair lift. If the answer is yes, alert the bus leader and appropriate arrangements will be made. Let's look briefly at some other things you should look out for. As we get older, the chances of falling increase dramatically. Clearly, we do all we can to avoid falls, but if one should occur, call for medical assistance immediately. Check with your veteran as to medications he or she is taking and remind them to take them on schedule. Veterans often get caught up in day's events and forget about their medications. The team list will show you, you if your veteran is diabetic. If that is the case, be alert for any behavioral changes that may indicate a problem and contact a medically trained guardian immediately. Likewise, oxygen use by a veteran is indicated on the team list. If breathing problems develop, follow the procedure previously outlined. Be aware that, due to some medical conditions, some veterans may be wearing Depends undergarments and may your assistance or that of a guardian of the same sex when using the restroom. There also may be other medical issues the veteran will share with you. Notify a medically trained guardian if you see any of the following. Dehydration, increased thirst, lethargy, complaints of dry mouth or sticky tongue, sudden weakness, chest or shoulder pain, confusion, especially in the early evening, known as the sundowner's syndrome. It's agitation, increased fear, so forth. Dizziness. Remember the two task columns on the team list where the jobs assigned to guardians are listed? Please turn to the last two pages of the materials for a brief description of each task. Instead of going through each task listed, find the tasks or tasks assigned to you on the team list and then find the corresponding responsibilities on the description sheet. Many of the tasks are self-explanatory. If your task has the word, quote, bag, unquote, in it, a ground crew member will find you at the airport in the morning and give you the appropriate bag for you to carry throughout the day. You will return it when we get back to Columbus. If you have questions about your assigned task or tasks, call your team captain or ask about it when you arrive at the airport. Now that you know all there is to know about being a guardian and what to expect on a trip, you may be wondering what happens next. On the Monday or Tuesday before the flight, you will receive an email from Kay Downing with instructions for calling your veteran before the flight, an updated team list, a checklist for the veteran call, and several other attachments will be included. It is important to call your veteran by Thursday, as he or she has been told to expect a guardian's call. In addition to going through the checklist, the call provides an opportunity to both of you to get to know each other. We usually have several veterans cancel during the week, resulting in reassignment of some guardians. As a result, you will un undoubtedly receive at least one email with an updated team list and last minute instructions or information. Finally, don't forget to be at the airport by 4.45 a.m. on Saturday. I don't have any letters for you, I got numbers. 38, just put 38 down in your brain. 38 pretty much captures the Korean War. There was a breakfast this morning, Bobby and I were at breakfast down at Grand, Grandview. 
And there's this veteran sitting next to us who went on a trip about three or four weeks ago. He brings over his book that Linda had made for him. He talked about the pictures and stuff. But he also said something about she knew so much about my war. So we don't know much about Korea. We don't know much about Korea at all because there wasn't much written about it. So, 38. It was fought along the 38th parallel. Now, for those of you who don't know, Columbus Broad Street is the 40th parallel. So, fairly close to where we are, only it's up in the mountains. The war lasted about 38 months, about 36 months, but 38 is close enough. And we lost about 38,000 American lives during those 38 months. Something happened there that should not be forgotten. When we call these Korean guys and ladies, they are so relieved to know that somebody is remembering what they did. Simply put, they fought the first battle of the Cold War. And when that war was over in Korea, which it is not, of course, because we're still there, the 38th parallel still stood. The communist troops had come across the crust back and forth the 30th parallel four times. It's all said and done, we're back to square one. No lines were changed in the world's maps. Communism was stopped there. And those guys and ladies who fought over there deserve our thanks for stopping communism in that first battle against communism in the Cold War. It was brutal. 38 degrees below zero. Imagine that. They were fighting at the Chosen Reservoir in summer uniforms at 38 degrees below zero. That's really cold. <coughs> and they were really outnumbered. And it was a massacre. Only we, the Marines got out. When you talk to the Marines over there, or the Army guys, they may have some horrendous stories because the Chinese fought very differently. And they may have some tears. They have kept this bottled up inside themselves for so long because our country just kind of ignored them. We talk about World War II and Vietnam just blink blink. And Korea just gets shuffled off the, off the, off the map here. So, you've got to become, especially the new people, Korean War experts in about 10 days. You don't have to become an expert expert, but know a little bit. And if you can mention a couple places, a couple events, and let them know you're interested. First time I said, the guy said he was in Busan, I said, oh, what was it like down there? You guys are surrounded. You almost ran off the map. He said, you know where Busan is? Now, I hadn't known three months before that. And all of a sudden, the doors opened, and he just talked and talked and talked. So, got some homework for you. That's what teachers do. Back on the back table there by Jim, before you leave, there's some papers for you to pick up. One of them is all about the veterans, and then one's a uh, PowerPoint that Larry's put together. And there's all sorts of information in there, not only about the Korean Monument and the Korean War, but also the Vietnam Memorial and the World War II. You see, you're going to be the expert on this trip. <coughs> they fought the war. They know what was like there. But most of the people have not been to D.C. to see their memorial. The Korean Memorial is perhaps the most spectacular memorial of all, especially in the evening. It is just absolutely breathtaking. 19 soldiers. 19 is half of 38. 19 soldiers. When they reflect into the wall, it makes 38 figures. That monument is very carefully thought out. Much more than just these little soldiers standing in a triangle. It's much deeper than that. And you talk to the Viet, they talk to the Korean veterans, the one we talked with this morning. He said, Bill, I stood there and I felt like I was there. Those faces were real to me. They weren't just statues. So take your time. Listen to them. Talk with them. Because we're moving to the point where we're taking all Korean veterans. Except for a few Vietnam guys. If you've got a Vietnam guy on your bus, go talk to him. Let them know how special they were. The Korean, uh, Korean guys and Vietnam guys came up with some pretty credible albums. This gets to make up for all of that for them. And they get to live it for all those guys that aren't ever going to get there. 
So, do your homework before you go. Don't wait till Friday night before the flight. Because you won't sleep either. Pick it up, start looking at it, get to know a little bit about it. And uh, check with your veterans that have been there and your veteran guardians. They've been there lots of times now. They've picked up them, them bits and pieces. Get to know the Korean Memorial. Get to know the Korean veterans. Be sure when you see the Korean veterans, look in the eye and say thank you. They need to know we know what they did. <laughs>